and only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Judith Barkan. Uh, I'm the president of the American Society of Cytopathology. I am uh, very, very happy today that we have one of our past presidents, Dr. Ed Sibas, with us today. Um, he'll be talking about thyroid cytology, and today's part one. Next week will be part two. Now, before I start, uh, let me uh, do a proper introduction, although Dr. Sibas has needs no introduction to anybody remotely related to the cytology field because he's such a well-known person, but uh, let's uh, give some information. Dr. Sibas is a, a professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and the director of cytology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is the co-author of the very well-known and very widely used book, Cytology, Diagnostic Principles, and Clinical Correlates. Now it's in its fifth edition. Uh, he's also the co-editor um, of the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology. Dr. Sibus, um, as you may know, completed his term as a president of the American Society of Cytopathology in 2016-17. He um, is the Michael Phelps of all awards in cytology. He uh, received the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Papa Nicola Society of Cytopathology in 2019. And in 2020, he received the Papa Nicola Award, the highest award given by the American Society of Cytopathology. He's also a uh, wonderful uh, pianist and an amazing speaker, and I just can't wait to hear him. Take it away, Dr. Sivas. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Gulies, and thank you all for attending this uh, two-part webinar. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today, I am going to cover... Um, three of the six Bethesda categories, and uh, I hope you'll join me next Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern time for uh, the other three remaining uh, Bethesda categories. I do want to say uh, right up front that this is a pretty basic thyroid FNA cytology tutorial. Uh, we just aren't going to have time uh, to cover some of the subtleties of thyroid FNA but I'm hoping to finish a little bit early today uh, and have time for questions. So please feel free to use the, uh, the chat function um, and Dr. Barkin will be monitoring that and hopefully we'll get to as many of your questions uh, as we can. Uh, so let me start with a few words of introduction. Um, the, the thyroid FNA is by far the most common FNA specimen that most laboratories uh, get to see. Um, and that's in part because thyroid nodules are very common. It's estimated that about 5% of adults have a palpable nodule. But if we look uh, more carefully at the thyroid glands, say by ultrasound, uh, more than 50% of adults have a thyroid nodule. Uh, now, just because there are a lot of thyroid nodules doesn't mean that we have to start sticking needles into them. Uh, but the fact is that it's not practical to do surgery for all thyroid nodules because the majority of them are benign. So we need a screening test uh, to triage um, the malignant nodules for surgery. And as we sit here today, the FNA is by far the best screening test for thyroid cancer. The American Thyroid Association has guidelines for selecting which nodules ought to be biopsied. And you can see in this image that uh, it's recommended, if possible, that uh, thyroid FNAs be performed using ultrasound for guidance. So let me ask a little thought question here. Do you think thyroid FNA is a diagnostic test? Or do you think it's a screening test? And the answer is it, it can be both. Uh, so for some of the conditions in the thyroid, like papillary thyroid carcinoma, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, medullary carcinoma, anaplastic carcinoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can make a diagnosis just like you can in surgical pathology. But for the whole very large family of follicular and Herkel cell lesions, the FNA is really not so much a diagnostic test as a screening test. Uh, and we'll get into that uh, as these webinars continue. Well, 
you know, why do we have um, the thyroid Bethesda system? Um, uh, we take it for granted today because it, it's been with us for a little bit over 10 years. Uh, but before the Bethesda system, we really didn't have a uniform terminology. And it's very important for us um, to speak the same language for the sake of clarity of communication. And also because it, um, it helps with the exchange of information across institutions. Thankfully, the thyroid Bethesda system has been widely accepted in the US and elsewhere, and it has been formally endorsed by the American Thyroid Association, uh, which has said that thyroid nodule cytology should be reported using the diagnostic categories of the thyroid Bethesda system. So here are the six um, Bethesda system categories, and I'm sure they're very familiar to most, if not all of you here. Uh, so I'm not gonna read them to you, uh, but I do wanna make a couple of general points about uh, this category-based system. The first is that the Bethesda system recommends that every thyroid FNA report begin with one of these six categories. Another unique feature of the Bethesda system is that there are two alternative names for some of the categories. And that's because a consensus was not reached on just a single name for all six of them. The idea is that a laboratory should choose the one it likes best and use it exclusively for that category. In other words, the alternative names like non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory are synonymous. I have to admit that I consider this to be one of the negative attributes of the Bethesda system. I'm not really aware of any other termin terminology system that offers uh, such a choice among terms. Another unique feature of the Bethesda system is the strong link between the terminology and patient management. and. Uh, the underlying principle of the Bethesda system is that this category-based system provides useful information to the clinician for managing his or her patient with a thyroid nodule. This works because the categories, as defined by the Bethesda system, stratify patients into different risk categories. And the implicit risk of malignancy for each category is based on published literature and shown uh, in two columns here in this table. Two columns because with the introduction of NIFT-P, uh, we have estimated the risks of malignancy if NIFT-P is included in the tally of carcinomas, but also a separate estimation of the risks if NIFT-P is excluded from the tally of malignancies. This risk assessment allows us now to make a rational management decision based on the FNA interpretation. The usual management for each of these categories is shown in this column on the right. Of course, the management of the patient, although very heavily influenced by the FNA interpretation, is also sometimes influenced by other factors like the size of the nodule, the sonographic characteristics of the nodule, and even the patient's own desires for treatment. Having said that though, the FNA is often the single most determinant, most important determinant of patient management. Uh, and this terminology gives us the tool that we need to communicate clearly with our clinical colleagues and with each other. The uh, next slide, please. So let's start by talking about the non-diagnostic or the unsatisfactory category. A specimen is non-diagnostic or unsat if it fails to meet adequacy criteria. Well, what are those criteria? A minimum of six groups of well-visualized follicular cells with at least 10 cells per group. Now granted, this is a relatively arbitrary numerical criterion it was originally established uh, by the Mayo Clinic, which was a pioneer uh, in the development of thyroid FNA in the United States. Uh, they felt back in the days in the late 1970s and early 80s that some criterion was necessary. Uh, and this is the criterion that they proposed back then. 
This is now 40 years ago. And although um, you know, there have been some other proposals, um, none of them have quite as much uh, robust literature and evidence behind them in terms of their performance metrics as these original Mayo Clinic criteria. They also seem to be the most widely used criteria and that's why they were adopted a little over 10 years ago by the Bethesda system. Now there are three exceptions to this requirement for thyroid follicular cells. The first is any sample that has any significant atypia, even if it's very sparsely cellular, you should never call that case non-diagnostic. Inflammatory conditions like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, a thyroid abscess, or subacute thyroiditis can be interpreted as benign, even if you can't find six groups of 10 each thyroid, follicular, or herthal cells. And then finally, any specimen that has abundant colloid is considered benign, again, even if you can't find six groups of thyroid follicular cells. Now, the Bethesda system doesn't define abundant. Um, we don't have quantitative criteria for that. We assume that somebody will recognize when colloid is abundant and when it isn't. The risk of malignancy of this category is kind of hard to judge because most of these nodules don't undergo immediate surgical resection, but the estimate is somewhere in the order of about 5 to 10 percent. In other words, most nodules that are initially called non-diagnostic uh, turn out to be benign. The recommendation is that uh, a repeat FNA be performed with ultrasound guidance and rows if available, and in most cases, the repeat FNA is going to be diagnostic. So here's perhaps an example of the most common scenario. This is a cystic nodule and the FNA only obtained cyst contents. What you're seeing here, of course, are macrophages. Some of them are pigmented, others are not, and there simply are no thyroid follicular cells uh, in this specimen. Uh, because this could be a cystic papillary thyroid carcinoma. We want to avoid giving the patient a clean bill of health. So we prefer that this be given the diagnosis of non-diagnostic. And that's really all I want to say about the non-diagnostic category. Let's turn now and talk about the benign category. This is by far the most common diagnosis that we make. And it's a very reliable diagnosis. The risk of malignancy is estimated to be somewhere below 3%. A very good negative predictive value. Now, the benign heading or category includes several subcategories, of which the most common is what we call in cytology the benign follicular nodule. Now, we needed to coin a term in the Bethesda system that included a variety of different histological terms and entities, colloid nodule, adenomatoid nodule, and the macrofollicular type of follicular adenoma, all of which look the same and all of which are benign. So we came up with the term benign follicular nodule. And what's interesting was subsequently I came across this, this quote in the AFIP atlas uh, on tumors of the thyroid and parathyroid glands. Dr. Rosai and his colleagues write that sometimes the histologic distinction between nodular hyperplasia and neoplasia is impossible, and they prefer the noncommittal term benign follicular nodule for these lesions. I don't know if they borrowed that from the thyroid Bethesda system, or not, I suspect that they came up with it independently, but it's a nice, I think, um, uh, sort of reinforcement of the necessity perhaps and the usefulness of this particular term, BFN. Okay, let's briefly review the histopathology of um, the most common uh, type of benign follicular nodule, which is the adenomatoid or hyperplastic nodule in nodular goiter. Uh, which you see on low power here on the left. Uh, the hyperplastic nodule occupies most of the field in this image on the left. Um, 
and it is mostly macrofollicular with large lakes of colloid. Um, and on high power on the right, you can see these macro follicles filled with colloid and the evenly spaced benign appearing thyroid follicular cells lining this space. Well, if you put a needle into one of those nodules, um, you're not gonna be surprised to know that what you get is typically a lot of colloid, uh, which in the field on the left, is this very thin, pale, purplish material in the background mixed in with all these red blood cells and then some fragmented macro follicles. The fact is that it's not easy for those large spheres of follicles to remain intact after you've done the aspiration uh, and manipulated the cells onto a glass slide. They tend to fragment and what you get instead are flat sheets of evenly spaced thyroid follicular cells. The image on the right is a liquid-based preparation, again, showing very similar findings, this fragmented macro follicle with evenly spaced thyroid follicular cells and some watery colloid up here in the upper left. Well, let's define the term macro follicle uh, and I will say right at the beginning that I th I'm afraid that the terms macro follicle and micro follicle, although they're very useful and will continue to use them, um, are a bit of a misnomer. Um, the problem with the term macro follicle is that it implies that everything that's big is a macro follicle, which in this case it is, but that everything that's small is a micro follicle. And that's simply not the case because macro follicles can fragment into pieces of different sizes. Many of them are large, but some of them are small. And to me, really the defining feature of a macro follicle is the even spacing of the thyroid follicular cells. And of course, their normal nuclear characteristics. They have round nuclei, they have the characteristic granular chromatin of normal thyroid follicular cells. But again, whether the piece is big or small, it's the arrangement of these cells with respect to each other that tells you that they are benign. I like to think of these benign thyroid follicular cells as cells that are doing good social distancing. Now again, um, benign thyroid nodules tend to have a lot of colloid and the colloid comes in two flavors, if you will. It can be either hard or so-called thick, as you see here. This is actually an intact macro follicle with, with a big blob of hard colloid. And here on the right is a liquid-based preparation, again, with these chunks of generally acellular material that has a hyaline or glassy appearance with irregular sharp edges and the very characteristic cracking artifact. But not all coll colloid is hard and very often the colloid actually has what we call a watery consistency. So here on the left, you're seeing a smear from a benign follicular nodule that is mostly colloid. And you can think of the colloid as a very thin sheet of cellophane, uh, if you will, covering often most, if not the entire glass slide when you make a smear. It also sometimes tend to tends to have this concentric uh, artifact and some small bubbles. These are very characteristic of watery colloid on a liquid-based preparation. The color with the Papanikolaou stain isn't very useful. It can either be greenish as you see in, in this area or sometimes it can be pink. But you can imagine that when you're making a liquid-based preparation, whether it's a thin prep or a short path, it's essentially impossible for this one large cellophane sheet to remain intact during the mechanics of the transfer of the material onto a glass slide. These, this large sheet of cellophane, if you will, fragments into smaller pieces of folded tissue paper. That's the term that we typically use to describe the watery colloid that we see in benign follicular nodules in patients whose FNAs are processed using a liquid-based preparation. Now, people often ask, well, how do I tell watery colloid from blood or fibrin? 
And I don't think it's really that difficult. Again, on the right, uh, I'm on the left, I mean, I'm, I'm showing you uh, two images of watery colloid with that characteristic thin uh, folded tissue paper-like sheet appearance. And on the right, I'm showing you the two most common manifestations of fibrin. On the top, you can actually see the fibrin threads of a microclot. That thread-like appearance is very different from the folded tissue paper appearance of colloid. Likewise, uh, on the bottom, um, you'll see um, a granular pattern to lysed red blood cells. Again, that granular pattern is very different from the folded tissue paper appearance that you typically see uh, with colloid. Also notice that colloid tends to be acellular, whereas uh, little blood clots uh, tend to have entrapped neutrophils, lymphocytes, and even bare nuclei of thyroid follicular cells. So to summarize, a benign follicular nodule is usually sparsely to moderately cellular and has abundant colloid. The follicular cells look benign. They're exhibiting social distancing. They're not overlapping. They're not crowded. And they don't have the nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. And macro follicles are the predominant pattern. More than 50% of the follicular cells that you see in a benign follicular nodule are macro follicles. And what that tells you is that you can certainly have a small proportion and even sometimes a somewhat larger proportion of micro follicles. But so long as they are the minority of the cell population, you don't have to worry about them. If you're convinced that the majority of the cells are macro follicle fragments, you can call that specimen benign. And here's what a typical report would look like. You use the primary diagnostic category, benign in capital letters, and then you can give it a short description, and that's entirely up to you. Let me say just a few more words about the benign follicular nodule. It's perfectly okay uh, to see some herpal cells uh, in uh, a benign follicular nodule. And here I'm showing you an example of a partially cystic thyroid nodule. Here on the right, you have a small fragment of a macro follicle. Again, notice the even spacing of the thyroid follicular cells, especially at the top of this fragment. And here on the extreme left, you have a prototypical example of thyroid herthal cells. These are altered follicular cells. They're much larger. Uh, the cytoplasm is much more abundant and has this very characteristic uniformly granular appearance. And the, even the nuclei are larger and can look atypical, if you will, with that characteristic endocrine atypia uh, that we're familiar with. A mixed population of benign, normal thyroid follicular macrofollicles and herthal cells is perfectly compatible with just a benign diagnosis. Another thing I want to say about benign follicular nodules is it's not uncommon to see a minor population of so-called cyst lining cells. And I'll show you some images of these if you haven't seen them before. So here on the left in this low power image, uh, I'm showing you a nice large fragment of a macro follicle. And then on the left, you'll see a very large fragment of cyst lining cells. These are much larger cells, which you can see a little bit better as I've moved them into the middle of the field here on the right. They have a flat sheet-like appearance, although sometimes that sheet can fold on itself. So don't be fooled by that. Uh, notice that here on the edges, these cells are evenly dispersed and again are showing good social distancing. And they have a streaming or school of fish appearance. Here's a higher magnification of a couple of other examples. Again, that even spacing, the, the lack of crowding and overlapping. Now, what you'll notice here, and this is typical of cis lining cells, is not, not only are the nuclei larger, uh, but they can often be pale in appearance. And they will make you think about the possibility of papillary thyroid carcinoma. They're pale very often. 
they, as you can see on the right, can have somewhat irregular nuclear contours. They can have grooves. They can have prominent nucleoli. So long as these cells are a very minor population in an otherwise perfectly normal appearing benign follicular nodule, you can ignore these cells. Um, I sometimes do mention them in the, in the um, descriptive part of my report, just in case somebody ever gets to see the case in consultation. They'll know how I interpreted these cells, uh, but that is optional. And sometimes these cyst lining cells can get really funky. Uh, here's an example of a case I saw a few years ago that has, again, what I would call endocrine atypia. They're still flat. They have that very characteristic streaming appearance, the low nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, uh, but notice the hyperchromasia and the marked <coughs> enlargement of these nuclei. And we published a paper about 15 years ago. Um, we had a, 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 um, about a handful of cases that had histologic confirmation. We were looking for the histological uh, correlate of these cells, and uh, we thought we found it. And here's an illustration from our paper uh, showing what we think are cyst lining cells. And in one or maybe a couple of these, we we're able to do a thyroglobulin stain and showed that these lining cells were actually positive for thyroglobulin. So we do believe that they are thyroid follicular cells. Uh, and if I have a sparsely cellular sample, I will include uh, these cyst lining cells when I'm counting thyroid follicular cells for the adequacy requirement. I will show you an, uh, perhaps an extreme example of a case here. This is an older woman, 76 years old, with a 3.4 centimeter isthmic nodule. The majority of the sample looked perfectly benign, as you see here on the left. It was partially cystic with these hemosiderin laden macrophages. Uh, and yet there was one group of altered follicular cells with the appearance that you see here. And the fact is that you can occasionally see intranuclear pseudo-inclusions in perfectly benign cyst lining cells. My colleague um, who signed out this case actually called it benign because he had many years of experience looking at thyroid uh, fine needle aspiration specimens and recognized these as fairly typical uh, cyst lining cells, but Trust me, if you're the least bit uncomfortable with a case like this, I don't think it's unreasonable to call the case AUS. But the point about this case is that the majority, the vast majority of the specimen looked completely benign. And this was a very small, very focal finding. Uh, and this patient is alive and well now five years later at the lovely age of 81. And we should all be so lucky. So to summarize, they have an elongated shape, distinct cell borders, low NC ratio. And again, the important thing here is you can dismiss them as benign because they are a tiny population in an otherwise very benign appearing specimen. All right, now I'm gonna to turn to something that's morphologically very different. Take a look at these two images. Uh, and I hope you'll recognize that this is a sample comprised of numerous dispersed lymphoid cells, most of which are small round lymphocytes, but there are some larger transformed lymphoid cells as well. And what is this aggregate of cells on the right? Well, I think as many of you know, it's not uncommon for lymphoid cells to aggregate, especially if they are in a germinal center. So what you're looking at here on the right is a germinal center fragment. Uh, not only are there lymphocytes here, but there are also dendritic cells. And these are these larger cells uh, with the large nuclei that have an open or vesicular chromatin pattern. And of course, it's these dendritic cells with their long cytoplasmic processes, which hold the germinal center together in an architectural framework that's very much like a spider web. So anytime you're aspirating anything that has germinal centers, whether it's a reactive lymph node, or as in this case, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you will find not just dispersed lymphoid cells, but also uh, lymphohistiocytic aggregates. So this is the second most common 
subcategory of the benign category, and that is lymphocytic or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And for those of you who like air dried preparations, here's an example of Hashimoto's on uh, an air dried preparation, the abundant heterogeneous lymphoid cells on the left and the beautiful hurtful cells on the right. And this combination uh, is um, certainly very typical of lymphocytic thyroiditis. All right, since we're talking about lymphoid cells, here's a 78-year-old woman who has two nodules, and the larger one that's four centimeters was the one that I'm going to show you the biopsy from. Now, I want you to pretend you're not looking at the image that's shown here, but just think about the clinical presentation. Four centimeter nodule, and you get an aspirate that looks like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, right? In this image, you'll see a lot of dispersed lymphoid cells and what appears to be a lymphohistiocytic aggregate. But can this be Hashimoto's thyroiditis? And of course, the answer is no, because you don't get four centimeter enlarging nodules in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So even before you look at the slide, you shouldn't be entertaining a benign diagnosis, no matter how benign this looks. Now, if you continue looking around at this specimen and you do what a good hematopathologist does, which is to put this, these cells under oil, you'll begin to get worried about these cells. Um, they have somewhat irregular nuclear contours. They have thick nuclear membranes. They have nucleoli that are more prominent than they should be for the small size of these nuclei. I'm not going to try to oversell this diagnosis because I think that this is very challenging and I'm going to make this multiple choice. So what is your diagnosis? Non-diagnostic, benign, AUS, or suspicious? And I actually think that there's uh, two very reasonable diagnoses here. We ended up calling this case a tippy of undetermined significance and recommended additional tissue sampling. We did not have flow cytometry on this specimen. But I think calling it suspicious for lymphoma is certainly reasonable as well. If you were very worried about the nuclear features that I showed you under oil magnification. Well, sure enough, this did uh, turn out on uh, a thyroid mass biopsy to be um, an extranodal marginal zone lymphoma. You can see on the left the destructive nature of this lymphoid infiltrate, which is very similar actually to what you often see with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But in addition, you also have these beautiful lymphoepithelial lesions, which are the destruction of the thyroid follicular cells by the malt lymphoma uh, neoplastic cells. And um, one more interesting case, I just couldn't resist throwing this in. This is a bit of a zebra here, but it just shows you how much you can do, how much you can accomplish with a fine needle aspiration. So here's a seven-year-old boy with the one centimeter left thyroid nodule. And here the clinical differential was uh, either ectop ectopic thymus tissue in the thyroid or a thyroid malignancy. Now, kids can get thyroid cancer, most typically medullary carcinoma, papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, but on the ultrasound, this one centimeter nodule had some of the same echo texture as the adjacent thymus gland. And so they did an FNA to rule out something bad uh, and perhaps to confirm that this is just ectopic thymus tissue. So yes, we got a lot of dispersed lymphoid cells. We're able to make a cell block out of it. And with a pair of uh, immunostains, CD5, and TDT, we're able to demonstrate that these are TDT positive, CD5 positive uh, thymocytes. And this was entirely compatible with just ectopic thymus tissue uh, in this seven year old boy. So the management of a benign diagnosis is simply a repeat FNA in one to two years. The frequency is based upon the ultrasound finding. Uh, so if you have a very suspicious ultrasound, they recommend that you repeat the FNA in a year. If the ultrasound is very low suspicion, they recommend repeating the FNA in two years. If it's somewhere in between, 
Oh, you repeat the FNA either one or two years hence. And if you have two benign FNAs, then ultrasound surveillance is no longer recommended. So we're going to say goodbye now to the benign follicular nodule and to Hashimoto's thyroiditis and other benign conditions that, it, that we don't have time to talk about. And I think you can already tell from the two images I'm showing you here that we're in a completely different world here right now. This is a 43-year-old woman with a thyroid nodule, and the FNA is extremely cellular. And there's very little colloid. And I think you can appreciate that the pattern here is very different from the predominantly macro follicular pattern that we saw with the benign follicular nodule. So this is a sample that fulfills all the criteria for this category uh, for which we have a choice of two names, either suspicious for a follicular neoplasm or follicular neoplasm. Of course, we know that uh, we cannot distinguish a follicular adenoma from a follicular carcinoma on fine needle aspiration. So this nodule has to undergo surgical excision, at which time we examine the capsule for capsular and or vascular invasion. And in this particular case, both of those were absent. Uh, so this was a follicular adenoma shown on the bottom. These are the neoplastic cells here and the normal thyroid gland at the top separated by a fibrous capsule. So I'll show you now a number of examples just so we can get this image in our heads of what a follicular neoplasm looks like. Again, they tend to be at least moderately cellular. The predominant pattern here is micro follicular. And again, it's not just the fact that these are small aggregates of follicular cells, but that these cells are showing architectural atypia they're no longer showing that nice social distancing that we were used to with the macro follicle. So if these individual follicular cells are residents walking into a conference room to listen to a webinar, instead of occupying a seat that's not yet occupied, they are sitting on top of somebody who's already occupied another seat. Or they're sitting next to somebody and they've got their leg over the leg of somebody sitting in the chair next to them. This is not good behavior. We don't encourage this. This is neoplastic behavior. And when this is the predominant pattern, you cannot call this specimen benign. So again, a moderately cellular specimen that's predominantly microfollicles. We do have some colloid here, admittedly, but not very much. And you can see colloid in some of these nodules. So the right diagnosis for this is either follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. And this patient uh, turned out to have an adenoma. In fact, uh, this patient turned out to have two adenomas, which is somewhat unusual, but does sometimes happen. Another example, again, a moderately cellular sample comprised mostly of microfollicles. Again, they're microfollicles because they're crowded and overlapping. There's not very much colloid in the background. So the right diagnosis for this is suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. In this particular case, I don't have any histologic follow-up for you. Uh, the patient elected observation despite a suspicious affirma test. Uh, the next case is also at least moderately cellular. Um, and this gets back to the fact that the terms macro follicle and micro follicle are somewhat misnomers because here on the right, you have a large fragment of thyroid follicular cells, but it is not a macro follicle. It's not a macro follicle because these cells are crowded and overlapping. And I'm going to start to sound like a broken record. Um, but again, um, what you're looking at here is not really so much a benign macro follicle as it is a an aggregate of multiple small micro follicles all stuck together. And again, the right diagnosis for this is follicular neoplasm, or if you prefer, suspicious for a follicular neoplasm. And this case turned out to be a widely invasive follicular carcinoma, but there's no way to tell that just from the fine needle aspiration. Another example, and I hope that these are beginning to look very similar.
a cellular sample, a very little colloid, crowded and overlapping thyroid follicular cells on high power. They really don't have uh, the features of papillary thyroid carcinoma, which we'll talk about next Wednesday. These nuclei are still round. Uh, they have granular chromatin. There's no intranuclear inclusions. There's very few nuclear grooves. So we wouldn't really be thinking of a PTC here. Again, the best diagnosis here is suspicious for follicular neoplasm. And this, again, turned out to be a follicular adenoma with a nice histologic correlation here at high power on the right. This is a younger patient. Again, um, I'm just showing you some high magnification images, but take my word for it that this was a cellular sample with very little colloid in the background. Uh, this is a pattern that we sometimes call trabecular rather than microfollicular because these cells are arranged in longer rows that we call ribbons or trabeculae. Um, but this is also an altered architectural pattern uh, because of the marked overlapping and crowding of these thyroid follicular cells betraying their neoplastic nature. And this turned out to be a follicular carcinoma. Uh, so here's the Bethesda definition for this category. It has to be a cellular aspirate uh, of follicular cells, most of which, more than 50% of which are arranged in an altered architectural pattern characterized by significant crowding and microfollicle formation. The sample has to be at least moderately cellular. If the sample is sparsely cellular, it should be interpreted as AUS or FLUS. Now, with the second edition of the thyroid Bethesda, um, we actually modified the definition of this category to allow for some mild nuclear changes. And the emphasis here is on the word mild. What we're talking about here is some increased nuclear size, nuclear contour irregularity, and or some chromatin clearing. You can call a case like that suspicious for follicular neoplasm or follicular neoplasm. Um, and the reason why we wanted to do this is we wanted to pull down as many NIFT-Ps into this category because the proper management for this category is a lobectomy or molecular testing. And that is the appropriate initial management for something that you suspect might be a NIFT P. So I'm showing you an example of that here. This is a cellular specimen that is comprised mostly of microfollicles. And if you look closely at some of the microfollicles, not all of them, some of them do have some focal nuclear clearing and a nuclear groove. It's acceptable to call a case like this suspicious for follicular neoplasm if these changes are relatively mild and there are no papillae intranuclear pseudo-inclusions, and no somoma bodies. And the case I'm showing you here did in fact turn out to be a NIFT-P. Now, if it's one of those cases that has some of these mild nuclear changes that make you think of a NIFT-P, uh, the Bethesda system offers you this optional note um, that reads as follows. The follow-up of such cases uh, can be adenoma, follicular carcinoma, or the follicular variant of PTC, including NIFT-P. And we do actually include this particular optional note in the cases in our laboratory that have some of these focal nuclear features. On the other hand, here on the right, uh, in this image from a case I showed you previously, which did not have any nuclear features of PTC, of course, you would not put on that note for a case like that. So this note is only applicable to the subset of these uh, cases that have mild nuclear changes that make you think of an NIFT-P. And I'll show you one more example of a NIFT-P NIFT that's very similar to the previous case. Again, mostly microfollicular, fairly cellular sample. I think you can appreciate that there is some focal pallor, but notice that it is focal. Many of these cells in the microfollicles have that nice, normal, if you will, granular chromatin pattern. So this is by no means a specimen that we would call suspicious for papillary carcinoma, and certainly not outright positive for um, papillary thyroid carcinoma. 
the only point of this is to say that it's perfectly acceptable to include cases like this in the follicular neoplasm category. And this turned out to be a uh, NIFT-P. Of course, this is an older case that used the pre-NIFT-P terminology, follicular variant of PTC, partially encapsulated. So the usual management, as I mentioned, for this category is either lobectomy or molecular testing. And the two most common molecular tests that are used in the U.S. are, are the Affirma test and the ThyroSeq test. I'm showing you two examples of these reports here. The Affirma test, the example I'm showing you here is of a benign Affirma result, uh, which would allow you then to follow the patient conservatively and uh, would preclude um, or allow you to avoid an immediate lobectomy. Uh, the same with the benign ThyroSeq result, but here I'm showing you a positive ThyroSeq uh, result. And uh, in the interest of time, I really won't have um, be able to say much more ab about that. I do want to make one point about um, uh, the, the choice of two names for this category. You might wonder, why do we have an option to call something suspicious for a follicular neoplasm? It's so much more cumbersome. Uh, the term follicular neoplasm is so much more elegant. Uh, but the fact is that you know, some laboratories, including ours, to be honest, prefer suspicious for follicular neoplasm because after histologic examination, many cases turn out not to be neoplasms, cases that fulfill all the criteria that you would want for this category. And here are just uh, two papers, uh, very nice studies um, that, that make this point. Um, this first study by Baloch et al. had 122 cases that fulfilled the criteria for this category and 57 of them, almost half of them turned out not to be neoplasms, but turned out to be adenomatous nodules in a multinodular goiter. And here in another study of 326 cases, not as many, but still a substantial proportion, 20% turned out not to be neoplastic. So uh, many of us feel a little bit uncomfortable calling something a follicular neoplasm when we know that anywhere from 20 to almost 50% of them will turn out not to be a neoplasm. Having said that, though, the term follicular neoplasm is so much more elegant, and I completely understand uh, why many laboratories actually prefer that term. But just to, to bring that point home, here's a histologic section of an adenomatous nodule, and it is a hyperplastic nodule that has a predominantly microfollicular architecture. And that's not unusual for ad adenomatous or hyperplastic nodules. They can look like this. And this is why they give us this falsely suspicious interpretation of a follicular neoplasm. So to summarize this category, the sample is at least moderately cellular. Um, more than 50% of the cells should be arranged in an altered architectural pattern. There's typically scant colloid. These cases can have some mild nuclear changes and if so, uh, you can add a op an optional NIFT-P note. So here's our final subject before um, we turn to some questions. This is a large right thyroid nodule. And the sample is very cellular. There is really very little, if any, colloid. And these cells look very strange compared to everything that we've looked at so far. These are large cells with abundant, diffusely granular cytoplasm. And of course, what you're looking at here uh, look like Herthel cells or alternatively oncocytes or oxyphilic cells. Um, we know that Herthel cells are altered follicular cells. They are positive for thyroglobulin, for TTF1 and PAX8. Um, and a sample like this should be called suspicious for a follicular neoplasm Herthel cell type. Herthel cells can have somewhat pale nuclei as you see here on the right. Um, and that's not that terribly unusual, but so long as they don't have any other features of PTC, you don't really have to worry about um, a papillary thyroid carcinoma. Of course, there is an oncocytic variant of PTC and we'll talk about that next week but they should have more obvious nuclear features of papillary thyroid carcinoma. So this turned out to be a Herthel cell carcinoma, but there's no way of telling. 
without doing uh, an excision and examining the capsule for evidence of invasion. Here's another example, very similar, very cellular sample comprised exclusively of Herthel cells. This was called suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm, but perhaps not too surprisingly, this turned out not to be a neoplasm, but an adenomatous nodule with oncocytic features. And as with the follicular lesions, uh, a substantial proportion of these cases that fulfill all the criteria for Herthel cell neoplasm, if you will, substantial proportion turn out not to be neoplastic. So don't be put off by that. We all experience this. This is very well described in the literature, and it's simply one of the limitations of thyroid fine needle aspiration. So one thing I do want to point out here, though, is the criterion in terms of cellularity is different compared to uh, follicular cells. For a follicular neoplasm, at least 50% of the follicular cells have to be in micro follicles. But to call something suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm, the sample should be virtually 100% Herthel cells. If you have 50-50 or 60-40 Herthel cells and follicular cells, that's a benign follicular nodule. Uh, so um, be careful not to confuse those two different uh, criteria. Uh, they are substantially different. The differential diagnosis of a Herthel cell neoplasm does include medullary carcinoma and other entities, and we'll talk about them next Wednesday. But um, but at, th at this point, I would simply encourage you to have a low threshold for doing a calcitonin stain, if you can, on a cell block preparation, preferably, and show that these cells are negative for calcitonin, but positive for thyroglobulin. The management here is the same as it is for a follicular neoplasm, either immediate lobectomy or molecular testing. So there are a few things that can look like a Herthel cell neoplasm besides medullary carcinoma. And here is a 56-year-old male. And before I tell you his clinical history, I hope you'll agree with me that these cells look very oncocytic, very much like Herthel cells. And if you didn't have any history, I think the right diagnosis for this would be suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm. But this patient has primary hyperparathyroidism. So of course, what you want to know is are these cells positive for parathyroid hormone? And yes, they are on a cell block shown here. Uh, and this was signed out not with Bethesda terminology because this is not a thyroid neoplasm. We just called it neoplastic cells present. Cannot tell if it's adenoma or carcinoma. And this actually turned out to be a parathyroid carcinoma. You can see the um, vascular invasion very beautifully in this image on the right. Again, just a reminder that a mixture of macrofollicle fragments and Herthel cells is a benign diagnosis. And, you know, I'll stop, I'll stop here. So today we've discussed three of the six Bethesda categories. And next Wednesday, I, ho I hope you'll join me. We'll talk about the malignant category, suspicious for malignancy, and AUS plus. So thank you guys so much for attending. And I hope we have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Stevas. This was a, this was a fabulous overview of um, uh, the thyroid, at least the three of the uh, thyroid categories. And there are a lot of questions coming. And uh, so let's kind of uh, go ahead and see. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to ask as many as questions as possible. For those of you, if your questions don't get answered, we will try to answer them next week too. So um, you can uh, continue asking them. So the first question is um, for the benign category, and this always comes up um, usually with a maybe a first year resident, your first time reviewing a case, and maybe you don't have enough uh, cells, but you have abundant colloid, and you say, look, abundant colloid, therefore we'll call it benign. And then there's the issue. Well, how, how abundant is abundant? Um, so what do you think about that? Well, I don't have an answer for you. I'll be perfectly honest. There is no quantitative criterion. Um, if you have any doubt that it's abundant, it probably isn't. Um, that would be the best way I can answer that question. I think, think of it this way. If, um, if you have no doubt, then it's abundant. If you're, if you're even asking the question, then I would say 
it probably isn't abundant. And that's the <laughs> best answer I can give you. I'm not going to pretend I have a better answer. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I feel like if, you know, if it was a C and I would want to jump into it, that's abundant. But if it's just a little bit of it and you don't want to jump into it, maybe that's not abundant. But okay, good to know. Good to know. Um, another question is, um, do you uh, ever subdivide or is there a need to subdivide the benign category? Meaning, you know, you have a benign follicular nodule, but, you know, maybe with cystic changes, with fertile cell changes, or maybe it's a cellular benign follicular nodule. Is there a rationale to subdivide this when reporting? Well, I wouldn't describe it as subdividing it. I think I would just be, I would describe that as using a descriptive um, a diagnosis to just explain the things that you're seeing. And we certainly do that. So it's not unusual, for example, for us to call something benign and then to say uh, follicular cells, colloid, hemocertinated macrophages consistent with a benign follicular nodule with cystic degeneration. So some kind of description to include all those features, whether there's focal herthal cells, whether there's focal cyst lining cells, I think it makes sense to mention those things. But I wouldn't consider that to be a subcategorization, just a way of describing the features of that particular benign follicular nodule. So with your reports, do you do a microscopic description? Uh, not, not, um, not a formal one, uh, but, but for our FNAs, we typically do include a very brief uh, description of what we're seeing. Certainly for the thyroid FNAs, we do. Uh, and I'll tell you, the only reason we do that is because otherwise it just looks so so barren to just have the word benign and nothing else underneath it. Like we didn't do any work, you know, so so it just, <laughs> I, I personally think it looks better to have a little bit of a description for thyroid FNAs that, that describes what, what, what it is that we saw. Gotcha, gotcha, very good. Um, the case that you showed, the lymphocytic thyroiditis, um, that's the one you did flow on. Um, and, you know, what would be the criteria or what would be the trigger for you to ask for lymphocytic thyroiditis, flow on a lymphocytic thyroiditis? Or, you know, you see lymphocytes, but when do you do the flow? I guess I'm asking that. Uh, so I'll be honest, we don't routinely do rows for thyroid FNAs here mm -hmm. at our hospital. That's simply because we have a very busy thyroid clinic and our endocrinologists don't want us to do rows because it would slow them down so much they'd have a waiting list of um, patients so long that they'd have to wait uh, over a month for an appointment actually. So um, we don't, we're not usually faced with that question during a ROSE presentation, to be honest. Um, my own approach would be if I had, if I was in that situation, if the sonographic features are entirely compatible with Hashimoto's and the radiologist or endocrinologist are not con not especially concerned for lymphoma, just because I'm seeing a lot of lymphocytes, that would not necessarily trigger sending a sample for flow. I think that either the endocrinologist or radiologist should have a suspicion that there's something more going on because the nodule is big or it's growing quickly, uh, or you're seeing some unusual features that you're, that are not typical for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Those are the two circumstances where I would recommend that you consider sending for flow at the time of rose. Okay, all right, sounds good. Uh, another question is about the parathyroid case. Um, uh, one of our participants asks, um, how was that signed out on cytology? And let me add to that, uh, When what would be your um, trigger to do a PTH stain, just because they look so much like follicular cells. Right, well, the trigger for doing the PTH in that case was simply the fact that there was a clinical history of hyperparathyroidism. Mm -hmm. But without that history, we, we, we don't routinely do a PTH for anything that looks like a Herthel cell. So uh, it was just fortunate that we had good clinical history there to do the PTH. And we signed that out as neoplastic cells present, consistent with a parathyroid neoplasm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's another question. Uh, how do you handle thyroid bed FNAs? Do you use the Bethesda uh, criteria? No, we do because it, it is a residual piece of thyroid tissue, presumably, if it's labeled a thyroid bed specimen. So we would we would continue to use Bethesda terminology so long as what we're seeing is compatible with the thyroid bed specimen. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, another question, I guess, on the adequacy um, uh, area. If the specimen mainly con contains follicular cells and small cluster of blood um, or follicular cells and small clusters plus blood, no cytologic atypia, what would you call it? Okay, you're describing a sample that has benign appearing follicular cells? Right. Blood, but no colloid, is that right? But no colloid and no atypia. What no atypia. So Question. Benign, just... benign appearing follicular cells without any colloid. Yeah, that's a good question. We do sometimes see that. That's not terribly common, but um, you know, it's surprising that there's no colloid in that specimen because it seems like there should be, uh, because you're seeing benign macro follicle fragments. I mm -hmm. would call that case benign, even though there are no, even though there's no colloid there. So long as there's no atypia, and so long as the majority of the follicular cells look macro follicular. But I would look at that. I would look at that case very carefully. I would examine those follicular cells uh, very carefully. Because it is a, it is unusual not to have colloid in a, in a benign follicular nodule, but it has been reported. Mm -hmm. It certainly does happen. Okay. Um, so, according to the Bethesda system, what would be an acceptable non-diagnostic uh, reporting percentage for a laboratory? Oh gosh. Well, the Bethesda system doesn't really have an opinion on that. Um, uh, in the Bethesda book, we quote the literature, and it's it's. It ranges from close to zero to something in the 20s, you know, 28 to 30 uh, percent. There's plenty of, you know, articles in the literature reporting fairly high non-diagnostic rates. So, um, mm. so the answer is that the Bethesda system doesn't really give us a benchmark for what we think it should be. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, of course, I think we all know that one way that you can reduce that is by doing rows on thyroid FNAs. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you don't mind my asking about what percentage is your adequacy, or your non-diagnostic rate? The last time I checked, it was around 8 or 9%. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Another question is about how to perform the thyroglobulin testing. Are you performing thyroglobulin testing on purple tops in cyst contents from suspicious lesions? Right. So, so I'm not actually performing it, but our endocrinologists are sending off an aliquot of the cystic fluid uh, to the chemistry laboratory. And I know very little, if anything, about how they have validated that particular test. All I can tell you is... Yes, uh, our endocrinologists uh, do believe that there is some value in measuring the thyroglobulin level in a lymph node uh, that they suspect might have a cystic metastasis. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that this would be in patients who maybe had a thyroidectomy and it is in the thyroid bed, or is it with patients who hadn't had a thyroidectomy? Uh, I'm not sure, Galiz. It may it may be both scenarios. It's a good question. Okay. Okay. Um, another one is the adequacy criteria on the thin prep. So you said you know most of your cases are done on thin prep. Um, how if did you or or how did you change the adequacy criteria on the thin preps? Uh, so they're the same for liquid based preparation and for smears. Uh, we don't have any evidence to suggest that the criteria should be any different for different preparation methods. Um, uh, so um, there's no reason to think that they should be any different for a liquid-based preparation. Okay. All right. And another question that people usually ask is, you know, we have the adequacy criteria written in the, um, the Bethesda system, but is it for only a single slide or could you like, put all 10 slides together and say, look at this, we have 10 to 12 clusters. Is that good enough? Yeah, yeah so there is some literature uh, that suggests that, um, they, you know, that they should be mostly on one slide. Uh, I'm not sure how robust that data is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and in the Bethesda Blue Book, um, there is a somewhat uh, cagey statement that says that they should preferably be on one slide, but um, but there's no reference given for that particular statement in the chapter on the on the non-diagnostic or unsatisfactory category. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I think the I think the yes, there are some laboratories that have adopted that um, um, that 
protocol that they should all be on one slide. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how robust the, the data are um, to support that and why you couldn't necessarily just add them up from multiple different slides, to be okay. honest. Okay, and that probably includes the cell block too, if you have a cell block for yeah. some reason. Right, you could and, and I will tell you quite frankly, that's what I do in my consultation practice. When I do look at cases that are prepared as smears and or cell block, I, I do typically just add up the total of what's present on all the preparations. Okay, sounds good, good to know. Uh, another participant asks about, is there a role of immunohistochemistry? Do you have a panel that you regularly use? Well, not routinely. Uh, we, don't, we certainly don't do IHC routinely on thyroid FNAs. We do it very selectively. Uh, and I think I've shown you a couple of examples. I'll show you some more examples next Wednesday of where I think it can be very useful. Um, perhaps the one that jumps out most frequently in my mind is the distinction between a Herthelsol neoplasm and medullary thyroid carcinoma. Very easy to go wrong uh, because there's so much overlap morphologically between those two entities. So again, I would recommend having a low threshold. Uh, if you see what look like oncocytic cells, uh, think about the possibility of uh, of a medullary thyroid carcinoma. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that next okay. Wednesday as well. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, here's another colloid question. Uh, I know you mentioned it, but this might be good to uh, repeat. Um, so colloid is easier to recognize on aspirate smears, but sometimes there are consults just on thin prep only. Um, how does colloid look like? Uh, on these thin prep preparations, and how can you tell if colloid is abundant on a thin prep versus it is not? Like a sparsely cellular uh, sample or well, on we'll sat. Let me tackle the second part of the question first. Again, um, you know, you, you look at a thin prep slide and it has lots and lots of colloid on it. You, it. It's abundant, and you don't have any doubt that it's abundant. If you if you have any question whether it's abundant, it probably isn't. So it's the same principle that applies to smears. It's either like everywhere and covering every field that you look at or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how do you tell uh, watery colloid from uh, on a thin prep slide, it has a very characteristic appearance. It looks like folded tissue paper. And I think that's very different from uh, fibrin threads and granular lysed red blood cells. Right, um, let's see, here's another question. How do you decide whether to classify a follicular pattern cytology specimen with nuclear atypia as suspicious for follicular neoplasm versus suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma? Or does it really matter since follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma and NIFP have cytologic overlap? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, there is clearly a gray zone there. So the best that we could do with the Bethesda system was simply say, if the nuclear features are mild and focal, then suspicious for follicular neoplasm. If the nuclear features are more pronounced than just mild, uh, if they're moderate or extensive, then suspicious for PTC or of course malignant and PTC. Um, it's impossible I think to come up with sort of quantitative criteria, how many cells, how many pale nuclei, how many grooves. Uh, we didn't even make an attempt at that because I think that that's essentially impossible. So it is a judgment call. That's um, something that we have to acknowledge. Uh, and I guess the only message I would have for you is if you think those nuclear changes are, are can be described as mild and focal or sometimes actually mild and diffuse, but very mild, then that's suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Anything more than that, you should consider suspicious for malignancy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. So a little bit about the cyst lining cells. Um, so you showed the, a nice stain showing that they were positive for thyroglobulin. So we're thinking that these are follicular cells that they morphed into the cyst lining cells. Um, and do they have any other name is the question. Uh, well, I think the most common name for them is uh, cyst lining cells. I'm not familiar with another name for them. I think of them as sort of being the reparative atypia uh, 
-hmm. of the thyroid gland, if you will. To me, they look very much like reparative atypia that we see in epithelial specimens, like a pap test or a bronchial uh, brushing. And in the histologic section that I showed you, I think they have that sort of reactive reparative atypia appearance, the enlargement, um, you know, the, there was a mitotic figure, if, if some of you might remember in that one particular image. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think that's a convenient way of thinking about them as kind of like a focal reparative change. Think of it this way, there's been injury to this nodule uh, because of spontaneous infarction and hemorrhage and now cyst formation and the follicular cells around that cyst are now trying to re-epithelialize that cyst, just like you would do with any ordinary epithelial lined cavity. Okay, uh, there are a couple more questions and I'll try to answer, ask them as much as possible. I am avoiding the uh, floss questions and the carcinoma questions uh, since you're gonna be going into those uh, next week. Um, here's a question. So, specimen contains predominantly microfollicles, but all the microfollicles consist of well-spaced follicular cells without crowding or overlapping. A benign follicular nodule is favored, but the predominance of the microfollicles are hard to ignore. What's the best classification in such cases? Well, if I understand the question correctly, then I would not I would not call those microfollicles because I believe what you're describing are small fragments of macrofollicles. When you say that all of those follicular cells were evenly spaced and there was no crowding or overlapping, mm -hmm. even though they're just you know 12 cells in a fragment, the fact that those nuclei are showing good social distancing to me means that those are pieces of a macrofollicle. And I think that, that you shouldn't hesitate to call that nodule, if that's the predominant pattern, you shouldn't hesitate to call that benign. So what I'm hearing is in order for something to be microfollicular pattern, the cells need to be overlapping, sitting on top of each other, correct? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's very important. Yes. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, did your AUS rate increase with the introduction of the molecular platforms? Oh, um, no, you didn't I, go into AUS, but I don't know the answer to that because I have not looked at that. That's a good question. And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that. It's okay. That's okay. Uh, there are a couple more questions about the molecular tests that you use, if there's any preference for one over another. I know it's kind of beyond the scope of this, but maybe I'm thinking um, next week when you're covering AUS, you can mention a little bit about that. Um, you know, if uh, uh, the part participants will have some questions on that. Sure, be happy to. Okay, sounds good. Well, uh, we are about 12 minutes over our time, but this was a uh, fabulous uh, session. And I'd like to thank you very much um, for doing this for the ASC. I um, appreciate you. And thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. And thank you, uh, Gulies, very much. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. See you next week.